Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all. This important conference guided by the theme towards comprehensive social protection for the informal economy. And I hope that conference will be a rewarding and useful experience for all of us, and especially for your organizations as well. At this juncture, let me invite Mr. Anna Nauman, the resident representative of the Free Trade Equity System, to, to take the podium as the host to make his welcoming remarks. Anna. His Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic of Namibia, my the Honorable Minister for Poverty, Education and Social Welfare, Sifania, Sifania Kamita. Cabinet members, members of parliament, governors present here. The country director of the ILO for Zimbabwe and Namibia, Popolong Pororo. Professor Marius Olivier, the chairperson of the Southern African Social Protection Experts Network, our good partner in the Forum for Experts on Social Protection, Professor Jairos Gangirai from UNAM. Representatives from the media, comrades and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I have the honor and even more the pleasure to welcome you in behalf of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung to this scientific exchange on social protection for the informal sector. Social protection has a long history. It all began with Article 22 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which states that everyone as a member of society has a right to social security. Followed by the Social Security Convention number 102 from 1952, which is a flagship of all ILO, ILO Social Security Convention, as it is the only international instrument based on basic principles that establishes minimum standards for all nine branches of Social Security. <coughs> Indeed, social protection has a long history. But we have to concede as well that the world has been dormant for quite some time and social protection is gaining more momentum, has gained more momentum in the last 20 years. And a lot has happened in the last two decades. The ILO resolutions 202, 203, 204 have accelerated the process to work on comprehensive social protection laws in the national environments. The SADC Social Security Code from 2007 guaranteed everyone at SADC the right to social security. Every member state is committed to establish and maintain a system of social security in accordance with the provisions of Article 10 of the Charter of Fundamental Social Rights in SADC. The AU social policy framework was formulated here in Wittok, in this building, in October 2008. <clears throat> to guide the African Union member states to develop and implement appropriate national strategies and programs. The AU has become meanwhile a pacemaker with a spiral initiative which stands for social protection for informal and rural economy workers. The Wagadugu Plan of Action has defined key priority <coughs> areas which shall help to increase the coverage by providing affordable health care through community-based health insurance scheme, providing occupational safety and health coverage for vulnerable workers at and at. All in all, more than 200 governments worldwide have expressed their commitment to protect its citizens against life risks. 
All these countries have started to eradicate poverty and subscribe to SDG number one, no poverty. Let me look a little bit back at history. The Greek philosopher Aristoteles has said already more than 2,000 years ago, poverty is the mother of crime and revolution. A strong sentence. Poverty is the mother of crime and revolution. And this sentence can be empirically proven if we look, for example, in the biggest economy of the world. The United States have reduced their social welfare, welfare programs considerably in the 1980s. And we had to observe in the following years that the number of convicted criminals has increased drastically, a situation which has not changed since. In comparison, if you look at Namibia, Namibia has done quite well in its endeavors to establish a comprehensive national social protection law. The social protection index developed jointly by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and an international coalition of CSO has ranked Namibia number 34 in the world. And in an inter-African comparison on place four, on four. So Namibia is definitely a role model. The political will is visible. The pro programs are affordable for the country and the public institutions are capable to implement it. Your government, Your Excellency, cannot be commended enough for the programs developed in the past years to overcome inequality and poverty. But we know as well that social protection is not a very popular topic in public discourses. It lacks ownership among the stakeholders. It's not an interesting issue in the media. And the relevant discourses take very often place only between the experts, the executive, and the international counterparts. This conference can help to increase popularity social protection. In nearly all countries, we have to state that social protection for those working in the formal sector is much better than for those working in the informal economy. The employees in the formal sector are normally registered with their social security commissions. They have better access to private insurance schemes, and they are even better informed on social grants than their colleagues in the informal economy. This creates a vicious circle which increases rural urban migration, increases income disparities, and enlarges inequality. The focus of this conference is on the informal economy. So who do we mean when we talk about the informal economy? Who are the men and women, the sectors behind this term? Instructive is a look into the latest Namibian labor market survey from 2016. The survey has counted the total employed population in Namibia of 680,000 people, out of which two-thirds, two or more than 450,000, work in the informal economy. <coughs> Approximately 50% of the urban employment is informal, but more than 80% of the rural employment top and Kavango West is more than 90% informal employment. The 
biggest sector in the informal economy in Namibia are agriculture and fishing, with more than 120,000 employees, followed by domestic workers, where we count 53,000, followed by the construction sector with around 50,000 employees, and the retail and transport sector with 43,000. These four sectors, fishing, domestic workers, trading, and construction, account for almost two thirds of the informal employment in Namibia. The informal sector is neither male or female. The gender shares are almost equal. So allow me to conclude with these few remarks. I wish each of you <coughs> two days of fulfilling deliberations, which hopefully lead to new research and political initiatives. I hope that existing personal contacts are strengthened and new liaisons and partnerships are formed. But above all, I would like to encourage you to remember we are all members of one big international family committed to the establishment of social protection. The Excellency um, Vice President of the Republic of Namibia, Honorable Minister of Poverty and Eradication, the Governor present here, members of Parliament also present here, the Country Director of the ILO for Zimbabwe and Namibia. The uh, Professor Kangira of the University of Namibia, other officials of the government of Namibia, representatives of the uh, residents or directors of the FAS, Freddie Hubert Foundation from Namibia and Zambia, distinguished experts from the SASPEN uh, Southern African Social Protection Experts Network, distinguished representatives from civil society organizations, non governmental organizations, trade unions, employee organizations public uh, political parties, think tanks, research institutes, and from other universities, presented from the media, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the conference on social protection for the informal economy in Namibia on the important theme, quote, towards comprehensive social protection for the informal economy in Namibia, unquote, held here in Vintuk from 6 to 8 November, and organized by the FESP, the Forum for Experts on Social Protection in Namibia. Since its inception in 2012, SUSPEN has been engaging in social protection, promoting, fostering, expanding, and improving social protection in the SADC region. The network provides platforms for exchange regarding social protection programs, frameworks, research, and consultation and creates networks that link part participants to relevant institutions. SUSPEN engages with academia, civil society, trade units and governments, and organizes conferences, workshops, seminars, and public forums every year. Our flagship program is the annual SUSPEN conference held in Johannesburg, the largest convening of social protection experts in the whole of the region. This is followed by country workshops, until now held in Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania, Mozambique, Lesotho, and Mauritius. Social protection for the informal economy is a theme that has increasingly attracted the attention of governments all over the developing world, including Africa. The government of Namibia is certainly no exception to this, as the very theme and contents of this conference suggest. In pursuing the difficult task of finding appropriate models and concrete strategies to meaningfully extend social protection to those of who operate in the informal economy, African governments are among others supported by guidance provided by the African Union and the African Union Commission in particular. I refer you in this regard to SPIRE work, the AU's social protection plan for the informal economy and rural workers, with its participatory and all-inclusive focus, and its emphasis on a minimum package of social protection uh, that should be available to everybody working in the informal economy. Social protection for informal economy workers is also a theme that is reflected 
in the AU social policy framework, as already mentioned, and in the AU's visionary document for the future, i.e. Agenda 2063, as well as in two new draft instruments of the AU, i.e. the draft protocol on the rights of citizens to social protection and social security, and also the draft social agenda 2063. Of course, the task of achieving social protection coverage extension to informal economy workers can only be realized on the basis of transparent and robust engagement with all relevant stakeholders, including those in the informal economy. This is indeed a contribution of this particular conference. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure and our privilege as SUSPE to welcome you to this conference. <coughs> I thank you. Thank you, Director of Ceremonies. His Excellency Dr. Nangola Bumba, Vice President of the Republic of Namibia, Honorable Bishop Dr. Zefania Kameta, Minister of Poverty, Eradication and Social Welfare, Cabinet Ministers, Members of Parliament, Governors here present. Mr. Haina Norman, Resident Representative, Friedrich Ebert Stuftu, Professor Marius Olivier, Chairperson of Board of Trustees Southern African Social Experts Network, Professor Jairos Kangira, the Dean of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of the University of Namibia, Senior Government Officials, Representatives from the Diplomatic Corps, Representatives from Workers, Employers' Organizations, Civil Societies, Academia, Research Institutions and Think Tanks, Representatives from Media, Distinguished Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen. The ILO, through its country office for Zimbabwe and Namibia, joins all invited participants in congratulating the Forum for Experts on Social Protection on the occasion of the Conference on Social Protection for the Informal Economy. The topic for this discussion we find is timely and very relevant. Despite significant progress in the extension of social protection in many parts of the world, the human right to social security is not yet a reality for a majority of the world's population. Only 45% of the global population is effectively covered by at least one social benefit, while the remaining 55% translate into about 4 billion people are not protected. The figures also show that only 29% of the global population enjoys access to comprehensive social security, while the remaining 71% or 5.2 billion people are not or are only partially protected. The lack of social protection leaves people vulnerable to ill health, poverty, inequality, and social exclusion through their life cycles. Denying this human right to 4 billion people worldwide is a significant obstacle to economic and social development. While many countries have come a long way in strengthening their social protection systems, major efforts are still necessary to ensure that the right to social protection becomes a reality for all. The massive social protection gap is not acceptable from a human rights perspective. It is a missed opportunity from a social and economic point of view. Life without social protection means that one, mothers have to go back to work right after giving birth. Two, unemployed people move to the informal economy in order to survive. Three, older persons cannot retire in dignity. Four, families do not have access to quality health care and five migrant workers face discrimination and social exclusion. This is especially so for many countries in Africa, Namibia included. And in line with the focus of this conference, particularly for those working and earning livelihoods in the informal economy. The informal economy, by sheer terms of economic activity and numbers of people, represents anything between 40 to over 70% of economic activity and more than half of the labor force in many countries, especially in Africa. Worrying is also the fact that the majority of people in the informal economy are women and young people. This represents a huge missed dividend to the economy at large. Social protection also contributes to sustainable economic growth by raising labor productivity, empowering people to find decent jobs, stabilizing aggregate demand, and stimulating local economies. There is a tremendous lack of reliable and comparable statistical data on social security coverage and most broadly on the quality excuse me, of employment in Africa. 
which prevents any precise assessment of these problems. However, the ILO estimates that in Sub-Saharan Africa, only about 10% of the economic active population is covered by statutory social security schemes. Most of the informal economy workers are excluded and face worse working conditions than those in the, in the formal economy, and they do not benefit from any form of social security coverage, at least in low-income countries. For the ILO, enhancing the coverage and effectiveness of social protection is one of the four pillars of the Decent Work Agenda. Extending social protection to the informal economy is one of the key strategies to address decent work deficits, supporting the transition to informalization and reducing poverty. As we work towards achieving the 2030 Agenda, data has shown that small investments of about 4% of GDP are needed to achieve universal coverage and benefits. The ILO has a global flagship program on building social protection floors for all. It is essential to help the ILO fulfill the goals set out in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to ensure that we leave no one behind and also to support the implementation of the ILO's recommendation number 202 on social protection floors. Namibia is one of the front runners in taking actions to protect its vulnerable citizens. The ILO released an assessment on the social protection floors in 2014, which made recommendations towards the improvement of benefits and efficiency of social protection in Namibia. As part of the Decent Work Country Program for Namibia, the ILO is now collaborating with other stakeholders to support government to establish a national pension fund and to make progress towards covering of workers in the informal economy. To this end, the ILO remains committed to supporting the adoption of national social protection strategies through participatory assessment-based national dialogue exercises that involve relevant ministries, social partners, civil society organizations, UN agencies, and other development partners. Good morning, sisters and brothers. Here in Namibia, we have a lot of uh, protocols, so I'm going also to do the same thing. Your Excellency, Dr. Nangolo Mumba, Vice President of the Republic of Namibia, the Honorable Cabinet Ministers, Deputy Ministers, and Members of Parliament here present, the Honorable Reverend Aino Kapo Angolo, Deputy Minister with the Ministry of Poverty and Eradication and Social Welfare, Mr. Haena Nauman, Resident Representative of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Ms. Hopolo Ororo, International Labor Organization, ILO, Country Director for Zimbabwe and Namibia. Professor Marius Wolifir, Chairperson of the Board of Trustees, Southern African Social Protection Experts Network, SASPE, and Professor Yairos Kangira, <coughs> Dean, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, the University of Namibia. Ms. Esther Lusepani, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Poverty, Eradication and Social Welfare, other permanent secretaries, all their representatives who are here present, distinguished invited conference dignitaries in your respective capacities and members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Director of Ceremonies, allow me at this onset to extend my utmost gratitude to the Forum for Experts on Social Protection and its partners for covering, of co for convening such a conference at these crucial times. 
where Namibia and the rest of the world are battling two opposing phenomena. And it is the huge economic recession and extreme poverty. It is therefore essential that we bring experts together to see how we together can fight poverty with the limited resources, financial resources at our disposal due to the current unfavorable fiscal environment. Namibia is a dual economy country with formal and informal sectors. The formal sector is characterized by a large capital outlay, formal structure and documentation of the business entities. It is included in the economic statistics of the nation. The informal sector entities, on the other hand, are small, mostly one person or perhaps two, and without formal structure and documentation. They are hardly in the national statistics and hence their roles are not recognized at all. As Namibia continues on its remarkable journey to fulfill its vision of eradicating poverty, reducing inequality, and addressing the challenge of unemployment, we are faced with a daunting challenge of addressing the structural and social imbalances carried over from the past. Director of Ceremonies, some may query the importance of the informal sector. Why are they there? Especially its contribution to the mainstream economy. While some people choose to be in the informal sector, many fall in the category because of unemployment. It's not their choice but they are forced by the circumstances they are finding themselves in. The informal sector plays a very important role in every country as it gives opportunities to people who are not employed to earn money through their various skills and businesses. And some are even not skilled and they are trying they are level best just to survive in this difficult situation. According to Namibia's social protection floor assessment country report, the majority of Namibia, of the Namibian people, operate in the informal sector. Many are migrants from the rural areas. The report says that close to 70%, I've heard now just from Mr. Norman that 80% of the population is in the informal sector. The majority of our people therefore work in the informal economy and are therefore vulnerable to job insecurity low and erratic income. 
And you know, they have children, they have people whom they are supporting. But with this income, of which you are not so sure, it is very, very much uh, difficult for them. Given the gendered structure of our society and their low status, women and girls are more severely affected by the scourge of poverty and other social ills, such as gender-based violence. Moreover, the challenges bring into sharp focus the issues of inequality, inequality and social exclusion. They touch on the very core of our societies, which are the human dignity and human rights of those most vulnerable. When we talk of social security, it's not a question of charity, but it's a question of human rights. And we cannot claim to be an independent democratic republic while ignoring this, because then we are ignoring human rights. Furthermore, when we adopted the Namibian constitution, we committed to set people, our people, on a path that would lead them from a society based on inequality to a society that promotes social justice and restore the human dignity of the Namibian people, particularly the poor and marginalized. And therefore, it is very much painful to see people living in shacks 28 years after the independence of Namibia. Director of Ceremonies. I will leave the in-depth explanation of what the informal sector entails and its importance to the economy, to, to the experts who will be speaking for over the two days of the conference. Allow me, therefore, to bring to the fore what Namibia is doing, specifically the Ministry of Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare towards ensuring and comprehensive social protection system for the citizenry. The Ministry of Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare is tasked through the social pro progression pillar of the Harambe Prosperity Plan to investigate the feasibility of consolidating the social grants in a more effective, coordinated safety net. It's a huge, huge task. It was while undertaking this task and through consultative engagement with various social protection experts and stakeholders that the ministry embarked upon a much broader exercise that will ensure a comprehensive, a comprehensive social protection system for Namibia including the development of a national social protection policy framework. The social protection policy 
has been developed because of the recognition that current social protection programs have an impact on poverty reduction. But there are Namibians who are not in, who are adequately um, covered and are exposed to the risks and vulner vulnerabilities that keep them in poverty. One key reform being proposed to be provided for under the social protection policy with the direct benefit to the pension. Because as statistics reveal, the majority of unemployed in this age group are women who are equally the majority players in the informal economy. The policy further aims to provide for the introduction of a national pension fund, which should facilitate participation of informal workers and self-employed persons through incentives such as easy registration regulations, less bureaucracy. Director of Ceremonies, <clears throat> undertaking the whole exercise of social protection reform, the Namibian government aims at developing <coughs> well-designed social protection systems, which are powerful to protect the most vulnerable and marginalized groups against shocks like severe weather, pandemics, and economic crisis as we are experiencing now. Eradicating poverty requires economic growth, which is inclusive and sustainable. We have been hearing of economic growth, there is now better prospects, the economy is growing. But the poor didn't know what we were talking about, what we are talking about. So we need economic growth, which is inclusive. These systems also help children stay in school, enable families to get enough nutrition food and provide a stable foundation on which people can build a better future. In conclusion, I would like to thank you once again for coming together during the three days conference. And it is my sincere believe that the conference will find ways as to how our men and women in the informal workforce can be assisted and be included in the mainstream economy to ensure property for all. In a discussion somewhere earlier Someone said, well, the informal sector will be always there. But I believe those who have been very much too long there and who have proved that they will be able to sustain themselves, that they can move to the formal sector. Let us remain committed to advance a social development agenda, which is human centered and promote the human rights based on the principle of social justice and integrity. We have 
in this room a lot of knowledge in social protection and that's very very good and it's important but we need mostly is hearts full of love ears which are listening to the poor and not prescribing to them what should be done and hands that will not delay action but that things can be done as soon as possible because what we have to do with it's a matter of life and death i thank you very much for the Director of ceremonies is pushing me here. He thought I, I have forgotten a big, big task he, he, uh, he gave to me while I was protesting. <laughs> I've been given the honor to introduce His Excellency, Dr. Nangolo Bumba. Um, to introduce such a person, I think you, you need another conference <laughs> for three days just to, to tell the people who then this man is. But I, I'm going to do it within a few minutes. His Excellency Kolombumba is the most humble leader I ever encountered. This morning, as I was leaving, um, uh, I was, I didn't want to put on a tie and say, but my daughter with whom I stay said, but you said the vice president is, is coming, so you should put on your tie. <laughs> Just to be embarrassed when I came in the so-called uh, seeing the uh, vice president sitting there without a tie. So such a person is Nangolo Bumba. We met, I'm not so sure whether we met um, when I was, according to the government of the day, when I was in, illegal in Angola. I'm not so very much sure, but we met for the first time proper in Bonn. We traveled together to Bremen and to Berlin. And we were a group of about six, seven, eight people uh, together with the late Anton Kudbowski. And during that travel, I, I got to know Dr. Nangolongumba. Uh, he wouldn't insist to, to be speaking always be asked to say something and he served in many capacities in our country. The most important one I think when he served as a negotiator from the side of the Namibian government on the issue of wealth respect. I think he was together with Brian Ekstien um, the South African ambassador and the two men I think were the right choices because you need in that kind of a situation people with wisdom people who can tolerate things and people with patience um, someone remarked some years ago after or during the celebration of the shall I say independence of Wolf Bay because I think it was in 1994 uh, someone said why didn't they call Wolf Bay Nangolo Bupa Bay <laughs> <laughs> and I agreed for it we know each other um, also within our families, our grandchildren uh, went together to school, 
and they would call us grandpa and we have decided also uh, to address each other also as grandpa <laughs> and now it is my honor to invite the vice president his excellency grandpa <laughs> okay as a as a blip Mahon's set. <laughs> May we be seated. As you can see, I was introduced by two people. My cousin, Yanga Chidikwa, who does not even know uh, why I'm calling him cousin. Uh, let it be known that I am cousin of General Major General Chen Chibikwa. Yeah. And then I am a cousin of Professor Dr. Chama Chibikwa. And then you follow. <laughs> uh, then I was formally introduced now or invited to come and speak by Right Reverend. Bishop Dr. Stefania Kameta, Honorable Minister of Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare of the Republic of Namibia. Uh, and Grandpa. <laughs> so we the only thing I remember when we met in Germany, I was a very naughty guy coming from Angola. And he had a suit, and I have a leather jacket. Coming from the bush, what else would they expect? So to test him, how swapper he was and how strong he was, I said, let us take a, a photo, but let us change our jackets. So he put on my leather jacket. I don't know how clean it was. <laughs> and I, I put on his... Uh, Cleric jacket, and we took a photo. From that moment, I believe he's able to take my bullet, and I'm ready to take his bullet. <laughs> Honorable Deputy Minister, also Reverend Aino Kapuakolo, thank you very much for being here, supporting the seminar, and also supporting your minister. Honorable Governor, Laura McLeod Kachirwa, Governor of the Commerce Region. She was, she's also my daughter and she was my deputy when we served at Suapo headquarters. And the other governor from Oshikoto, <laughs> Governor Kamboshi, I don't know how he made it <laughs> to come to Commerce this morning, but that is also one of my region. You understand what I mean. Honorable members of parliament who may be here, uh, high level government officials, your excellencies, members of the diplomatic corps, if any, my good, my good friend Haina Mauman. Resident representative of the Frederick Ebert Stiftung, Professor Marius Olivier, you have already heard about his many titles and who shuttled between Africa and Australia. My sister, Opolang Ororo, representing ILO. My other colleague from UNA, Professor Jairos Kangira, leaders and representatives of trade unions, employers federation, and civil society organization, I see SG Tukna Kadguha, and I'm sure he will be talking to you, you hear his 
He's, he's, he's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Distinguished invited guests and participants, speakers and moderators, distinguished members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. In the first place, let me join others in welcoming you all to this conference to Windhoek and to those who came from outside Namibia to Namibia. <coughs> speaking at the bottom of the list of speakers is always a problem. In the first place, you are forced to repeat what others have already said, <laughs> and it's not interesting. The only good thing is that after you have spoken, then people are relieved of the tyranny of the higher table and so that everybody can talk. So after I spoke, there will be some few things and then it become now our conference, all of us. Uh, Dr. Kameda was saying, he was expecting me to have a tie. As you know, many politicians don't sleep well today. <laughs> They were watching television, following elections in some major countries. I can't mention them. <laughs> so when I woke up, I woke up in the mood of and having read and understood the material. People excluded, people included. I was in a fighting mood. <laughs> I did not want to be tied, just in case. <laughs> That is a quarrel between me and Kadihuha. <laughs> I don't have a tie, so he cannot harm me. Uh, but I was asked by one of my relatives, why don't you have a, a why don't why you not dress like you usually go to work? I say I'm going to join other workers and to protest. <laughs> so it is a process of protesting. Thank you for the foresight of hosting this conference against the backdrop of the global economic downturn, which has negatively affected many small, medium, and micro enterprises in Namibia as well as globally. I trust that as we explore the conference theme, and I quote, towards comprehensive social protection for the informal economy in Namibia, end of quote. We will be open-minded as experts, as scholars, as policymakers, and even as micro-business owners to seek pragmatic solution to address the problems emanating from the absence of social protection in the informal economy. We are mindful that the informal economy is not a mere academic discourse. It's not something you just discuss, but it is an everyday harsh reality of the thousands of Namibians who are eking out an existence in this sector, whose lives need to be substantially improved by the policy proposals <coughs> coming from this conference. Director Ceremonies, according to the United Nations report on world social situation, 2018, and I quote, workers in informal employment, among whom young people, persons with disability, migrants, you might say I am not a migrant, but, but uh, 
You are here in the commerce region. <laughs> but uh, we're not exactly born in, <laughs> in commerce. Women and other disadvantaged groups are overrepresented, are insufficiently covered by social protection, or not even covered at all. Employment-based contributory schemes, in particular, cover mainly workers in formal employment, and therefore leave a significant proportion of the labor force totally unprotected, end of quote. Also, and I'm quoting again from, I'm referring also again to the World Social Situation Report of 2018, state that workers whose jobs are not subject to national labor legislation, taxation and social protection, are employed in the informal sector, but some are employed even in formal enterprises, but at lower level. Some are employers themselves, they employ themselves, while others are self-employed or work as unpaid family members in our houses, on our farms and in our businesses. We don't even pay them. They are relatives of ours, they are friends of ours. We don't even pay them because they are in the informal sector. And they work even without the contract. So that when you want to chuck them out, you just chuck them out. There is no contract. I'm glad the representative of the ILO. The National Labor Organization is here. ILO's World Social Protection Report 2017-2019 reveals that about half the global workforce is in informal employment. Majority of these people lack social protection coverage due to a variety of factors, including exclusion from legal coverage low and volatile earnings, and complex administrative procedures. Also, workers in the informal economy are often excluded from programs targeting poor or low-paid individuals and households. This leaves many informal workers, many of them women, without effective coverage. Many instruments, such as the UN's Sustainable Development Goals under Target 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, the ILO's Recommendation 202 of 2012 and 204 of 2015, all affirm the need for extending social protection to workers to unleash the productive potential of the informal economy and to hasten its transition to the formal economy. That seems to be the idea, as Bishop has said, that those who are in the informal economy somehow are happy to be there. Let them just stay there. They are happy to be there. They don't need to move up. There is no such a thing in life. They want, everybody want to improve their own condition and the condition of their families. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, locally, the Namibian Information Economic Case Study Report 2016-17, now the Namibian Informal Economy Case Study Report. I should not give you the, the new name. 2016-2017, commissioned by the Labor Research, the Labor Resource and Research Institute, LARI, concluded that similar to peer African countries, Namibia also faces many key developmental challenges, such as lack of decent and secure jobs 
and lack or insufficient social protection for workers. It further stated that employment created in the informal economy sector is reported to be mostly exploitative and insecure. Another Namibian study in 2017, I quote, baseline study on the promotion of social protection for the informal economy and vulnerable workers in Namibia, end of quote, commissioned by Tukna, Tukna chief is here, and first, Frederick Herbert Stiftung, their representatives are here, concluded that discussions of extending social protection to the informal economy have not featured prominently over the years in the policy space of our country and other countries as well. While we have an extensive social protection system, which is considered as one of the best in Southern Africa, the government is aware that social protection coverage of workers and operators in the informal economy due to its reported complexity is limited. Therefore, platforms such as this one is much welcome. For us as government, for us as labor, for trade union, for us in private sector, and it should also be so for us as development partners to collectively seek solutions to the problem facing the informal economic sector. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> to address the problems of social protection exclusion in the informal economy, we need to understand the fundamental drivers of social ex exclusion on a broader scale, which in the case of Namibia and Southern Africa are rooted in the historic political and economic exclusion of the majority of the citizens by the preceding colonial and apartheid administrations. The structural foundation of exclusion of a majority of our people from all opportunities under the sun during the colonial era is today a real legacy, a standing legacy, a shouting legacy, or an aftermath playing a strong reinforcing role in the sense that the formerly disposed or dispossessed people do not have assets currently on which base they could gain financial credit and transition from the informal to the formal economy. Most of their little informal businesses or business effort are characterized <clears throat> by daily struggle for hard, for from hand, whatever they earn, they use it from hand to mouth for the purpose of survival. Moreover, there seem to be negligible or zero deeper level appreciation of the impact of this historic fundamental drivers of social economic exclusion and perpetuation, not only on the informal sector, but also on those previously disadvantaged Namibians who entered and failed in the informal sector. You may try to enter, but if you don't have the preparation, if you don't have the resources, if you don't have the support, you are going to fail in the informal sector. The presence of a deeper level of understanding of the countless obstacles facing such entrepreneurs in the formal, in the form of lack of sufficient financial credit, no money, deeper supply sources, you, you have cheaper supply sources, can't get things at reasonable prices, you don't have 
business linkages to other people. When you enter there, they look at your face and they already know you don't have the money. A formidable array of administrative and financial accounting, compliance requirements, barriers. We hit you with the rules and you don't understand the rules, so you cannot jump over those rules. The space to rent are scarce and expensive. All these are problems. And prohibitively expensive commercial space, which I mentioned already, would mean that we as a government and society as an entrance to the formal economy. Otherwise, the majority, perhaps even 90% of them, will continue to fail or stagnate within the informal economy the national economic inequality status quo will maintain, will be maintained. Uh, I don't want to use political words until Jesus comes, but that will not be the case, but it will be maintained for a long, long time to come, which we do not wish to happen. If such are the formidable challenges facing the previously disadvantaged Namibia, who happen to have entered the formal economy, how much more prohibitive is it than for those in the informal economy to transmit towards the formal economy, not least to offer social protection to the employees for us to succeed in our goal to uplift the previously disadvantaged Namibians, both in the informal and the, in the formal economy, as part of the overall objectives of the economic emancipation of the second national struggle, as we call it, a groundbreaking change for a fundamental structural deconstruction in terms of our laws implementing institution and conceptual understanding is therefore seriously needed. The case in point is the recent incident where the Windhoek City Police efficiently implemented the old 1960 or 1970 municipal bylaws and statutes stating that no one should sell in public without a license. A license which those selling in the informal market seemingly are unable to access by virtue of the, their inability to have money to get it. Therefore, in pursuance of law and order, the police went, confiscated the goods, locked some vendors up, and eventually charged the prescribed heavy fines for this quote unquote trespassers to be released. First, you don't have the license because you don't have money. You try your best, <laughs> you get in trouble with the law. You get in trouble with law, the law demands that you pay. <laughs> to pay with what? <clears throat> so we are making mockery of ourselves and of our own understanding. We need to frankly ask ourselves, therefore, whether we are aware that these bylaws and other laws which we have inherited <laughs> are the ones reinforcing an exclusivist and anti-economic empowerment mentality among our bureaucrats in government. Is that the case? To which extent are these and other laws and practices which we accepted as the normal way of things, perpetuating the poverty and the economic exclusion of our people. 
are such practices not against the grain of the spirit and letter, or letter and spirit, of our manifest national aspiration of economic emancipation for all our citizens? That is a question. We need to interrogate these things and change them. <laughs> So that our bureaucrats, <coughs> I'm a former bureaucrat, I should not tell too much about the bureaucrats, I'm a former civil servant. Our institutions, local authority, regional, national, and our policy are all in line and in synergy with the Harambe's strategic direction toward the objectives of economic inclusion and upliftment of all our citizens. I told you, the last speaker always has to speak a little bit longer than others, otherwise they will not invite you next time. <laughs> now I think I have, I have done what you invite me to do. With this, for a politician, few remarks. <laughs> May I, in conclusion, extend a special word of thanks to the eminent local and international speakers, Frederick Herbert Stiftung, Yuna, Sapem, and the Ministry of Poverty Eradication and Social Welfare. And to all of you, all of us, as conference participants, I trust that you will engage in fruitful discussions over the next two days in an effort to ensure that this conference bears meaningful outcomes for the benefit of all our people. I now have the honor to declare the conference, and I quote, Conference on Social Protection for the Informal Economy in Namibia. And the quote, officially open. And I thank you for your patience. <laughs>